Okay, welcome everyone to our last lecture on machine learning. So we are still in section 19. Last time we talked about sampling and a bit about Markov chain Monte Carlo method. No, Monte Carlo Markov chain method. So I can't remember MCMC. So that one and that's what we will continue today. In particular, we will try to understand why it works or when it works, get a bit more insight, but also a little bit mathematical underfitting here so that it's kind of also proven or at least part of the steps I will show you what needs to be shown such as the MCMC method works. And then I show you two examples, the Gibbs sampling approach, which is like a special case. When I show you slice sampling, which is also quite interesting methods, I show you the implementations of that. And then finally, I show you a very nice paper from Pesi Diakonis, where he also talks about the Markov, uh, the MCMC revolution. So let's, let's not spell it out. So I probably mix it up. So that will be a very interesting paper where there's also some code and some demo, which is fun to watch. And it's kind of curious and an application where you might not have thought of. Okay, so let's get started with the um, MCMC method. Okay, there it stands, Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Okay, so I need just need to remember that it's Monte Carlo methods and then there's some Markov chain in front of it. Okay, so that's easy. So just as a reminder, those are slides we've seen last time already, but let's just go through it so we have a good start. So the goal of Monte Carlo methods is on the one end to generate random samples from a PDF for whatever reason you have, okay? So maybe you just want to simulate data or you want to generate interesting interesting data for new methods that you're developing. Yeah, in econometrics, there are some super fancy things like double ML, which stands for double machine learning. So I just got exposed to these kind of papers and there's a whole universe of methods and stuff where people from econometrics, from so people really know statistics super well, they use methods for machine learning in a super clever way. And um, so there's a lot for you also to explore after the lectures. And um, in, in these kind of methods, it's often interesting then to generate data from a model where you exactly know how the data was generated, okay? And then you apply these new methods and then you check empirically whether they are unbiased or whether they are this or that or whether they have the right properties that are promised from the mathematical source. So generation of random numbers is a super interesting topic in itself. However, sometimes it's also used to estimate expectations. So that's one big application of generating samples among generating data sets. And that was the idea that we can replace an expectation, which is basically an integration, by a finite summation from finitely many samples from certain distribution. And that can typically be done if the function you want to integrate over can be written as the product of a PDF and then some other function that you can calculate with your computer. So you have an implementation of phi, you have uh, some other function that is generating samples from P of X, and then you are in business and you can start numerically estimating the integration. Of course, this works really nicely in one dimensions and in higher dimensions, it's getting really, really very difficult because in higher dimensions, the space is so large. So to fill it up with finitely many samples, like that's a big problem. However, nonetheless, you can try these things like these MCMC methods also in these higher dimensional spaces. So, and sometimes it's the only thing you can do. So it's worth an attempt. Good, last time, We've seen among the MCMC method, we've seen how to generate IID samples. So independently, identically distributed samples. Okay, and we had different ways to do that. So we use transformation of samples trick, right? Starting with the uniform distribution, which is typically implemented in a computer. And look it up in the books from Donald Knuth, The Art of Computer Programming. He explains how to generate uniform samples. So how to use the modulo function in some other cool numerical stuff to get like um, pseudo random samples, which are pretty uniform. However, starting with those, we can transform them just by putting these samples through a computer program and doing some nonlinear operation on it. And of course, this will generate some other distribution. So the uniformity will be lost when you apply nonlinearity to it. However, of course, Actually, we are given a PDF and now how, what function should we use to transform the uniform samples? And that is answered basically by the transformation of sample stuff that we've seen last time. So the short answer is given a PDF, you need to derive the inverse cumulative distribution function. That is your function, your nonlinearity that you want to use. 
This inverse CDF also has a name, yeah, which I also recently learned about. So it's called quantile function, curiously, which totally makes sense because it's, it's kind of um, having as an input a number from zero to one, right? Since it's the inverse CDF and the quantile is something that's a 5% quantile, which is basically a certain value along the CDF and 5% of the data is left of it and 95% of the data is on the other side. And, and that's exactly what the inverse CDF is calculating here for you. Good, and then there were other methods, rejection sampling, which is basically saying, okay, take some simpler one where you can sample from, and then to ensure that the samples kind of, that you let through are then really from the distribution that you actually want. So some of them need to be rejected. And then there's another idea of reweighting samples. So that's like the important sampling. There were a couple of tricks. There were like these, um, self-calibrating important sampling where you um, were able to use a sampler for a non-normalized PDF to sample from another non-normalized PDF. So that was quite amazing that that's possible, but with some clever tricks that's possible. Um, today we will look at dependent samples, right? So why should they be IID, right? What Only what we care about is that the samples are at the end from P of X. But as you know, suppose you have like a Markov chain or some other stochastic process, these things typically converge against some stationary distribution, which means that if you let a Markov chain run very long, like you can say something about the distribution of the samples that you get after running it very long. And they come from the so-called stationary distribution as we will see today. And at least, uh, so if your Markov chain has the P of X as a stationary distribution, you can also take the samples from a Markov chain to do this kind of stuff, okay? And curiously, um, dependent samples, the idea is that when you have a sample, a good sample from a PDF, it tells you something about the location where the density is, right? So then basically it tells you something about the mean already, where the mean should be, or maybe where there's a bump in the PDF, it's a good, if it's a good sample. So why not use that information and say, okay, I have already a good sample, let's produce a similar one. So let's not just ignore the fact that I know already about some samples, but let's take one, uh, let's take the current one and let's um, produce another one. Of course, saying that, I should make a note to myself. This suggests, of course, methods where I'm not taking account the last samples. I could take into account all samples that I've seen already, right? Maybe that's an even more clever way to generate samples. So that might be something to think about offline. Anyway, so the idea is that given a current sample, I can maybe e more easily produce another good one, okay? And that is typically done by the so-called proposal distribution, which is here written Q with the letter Q. Naming uh, some distributions with P and some with a Q, um, that's like also a convention. Often when we talk about Bayesian networks or about distribution, all the distributions get the letter P and they are distinguished by their input that we put in. However, sometimes in the field of statistics, people prefer to be more mathematical here and to give different distributions different names, okay? And that's what we're also doing here in this MCMC topic. Otherwise, it gets really confusing because there are different distributions at the same time, okay? Good, so what is the Markov chain? I showed you that slide already last time. Very briefly, if you have a joint distribution of independent variables, basically it factorizes into the marginal distributions. In general, if I have a sequence of random variables that can have any dependency structure like in a Bayesian network, I can apply n minus one times the product rule to get like this product where I have a, like a changing number of um, conditions here, right? And for each sorting of my variables, I get a different factorization, right? And as you know, there are as many sortings of the variables as they are fully connected graphs. So those correspond to the fully connected graphs. However, sometimes the graphs are not fully connected and then I have a more efficient representation and the Markov chain is an example of that one where I'm only conditioning on the previous example. And last time I draw, I, I made a picture on the board and it's still here. So this is a graphical model for a Markov chain, okay? So it's a particularly simple one, yeah? Good, so that is now, if I want to sample from, um, a general sequence, I would have to condition on all the previously one. And as I just suggested, that might be something for offline to think about, whether that might be also a clever way to think about 
instead of having only the, the predecessor and generating a new one, you could also take the last five points and then maybe do a convex hull around it and sample from the convex hull of those points or whatever, right? So there might be better ways to sample in higher dimensions. I don't know yet. But in principle, like the simple implementation of the idea of departing from independent um, samples is to use a Markov chain. Okay, so then the first method we've seen, I show it already at a glance. So what's the Metropolis method, which basically now says, so, okay, I have access to some unnormalized PDF, which I can calculate. So I have an implementation of the PDF, but I don't have an implementation of a sampler or something. However, I have a sampler from, for some proposal distribution. Think of a Gaussian distribution, for example. And then given now my current location, I generate a new sample from my Gaussian distribution. And with a certain acceptance ratio, I will accept that sample or I will reject it. If I always would accept it, that would be kind of weird. Then I wouldn't look at all at the P star, right? So I have to do something with the P star in this iteration here. And so the way I'm using the P star is whether I check whether my new X prime kind of is um, more likely under my unnormalized PDF than my current location. And so if my X prime is kind of better, like even coming better from the PDF than the previous one, then the minimum of one in this quotient will be one. And so my acceptance number will be one, which means I accept X prime with probability one. So for sure, that will be my next point. However, also for the, let's call them losers, right? So the X primes, which reach a lower probability than my current value, for those also allow, okay, I throw a coin, okay? And the value of my coin will be the probability of seeing heads will be depending on how bad my X prime is. So if my X prime is super unlikely under the P star, then the, the top part here will be very small. I can't mark it. Um, and so the probability of acceptance will be rather small. So my, maybe in one out of a hundred cases, I would also accept a super bad one. Yeah, but in general, I won't do this. So why might it be a good idea also to accept super bad ones? Um, for that one, um, let me draw a picture. Which one do I take? Let's erase that one. Or oh, let's erase everything. So suppose your P of X looks like this. Okay, so this is P star of X. Okay, it has two bumps, yeah. And now let's say we start sampling from it. So let's say we are right here and we put a Gaussian distribution here. And so that is our X1. And then we sample here. So that is possibly it's first it's an X prime. Then, okay, we compare the height of that one and that one. And as you can see, they are almost the same. Yeah, so the acceptance ratio will be like 0 0.9 or 0 0.95 or something, right? Because it's a, it's a number which is almost the same as the X1. So the probability of accepting that one is very large, so that becomes X2, and so on and so forth. I put a Gaussian now at my new one. I sample one over here. Here my P X is even larger, so this will be my X3, and so on and so forth. So I generate lots of samples. However, what about these guys here, right? The MCMC method says that it's guaranteed to, to really sample from the whole thing, right? So, but how can it get over here? It can only get over there if I'm, let's say, at x100, for example, I'm here. I'm again sampling from my Gaussian distribution, but by, by chance, this is my candidate here. And here everything is super small, right? So if both are super small, then it's like 50-50 to accept it. However, it could also be that maybe my proposal distribution is much larger at this location for the x prime. So the probability might be really, really small in this case, really to um, accept it. Oh, no, it's, it's about the ratio of that one and that one, sorry. So it is very unlikely to accept it, but sometimes I do. And once I did, I sampled from that one and suddenly maybe I'm jumping over to the other side and then I'm jumping into the other, other bump and then it goes on, okay? Even though if the probability is zero over here for my Px uh, P star, it can still happen 
that my Gaussian distribution that I sampled from here, which looks like it's zero, however, also with a certain probability, yeah, I might sample the next candidate over there. Yeah, it's super unlikely, but it can happen because the Gaussian distribution has chance to sample from everywhere. Okay, so also from this location. And once I'm in here, I will go on and I sample from that one too. Okay, so that's why sometimes it's good to be non-greedy. So also to accept the points which are actually smaller. Okay, so that is the idea of this method. And um, of course the recipe here, so the curious thing is, this is an algorithm here, right? This computer program that's given. However, um, being a mathematician, yeah, we can also reason about it and we can translate this computer program now in transition probabilities and blah, 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 blah. And then we can show some theorem about it. Okay, so there's, it's an interesting interplay between algorithm and math. So in a way, um, <clears throat> I'm getting here Markov chain where I'm having um, certain transition probabilities of going from xt to xt plus one. However, this transition probability is not super trivial, but I write it down on one of the following slides and we go through it trying to understand it. However, the transition probability is going from xt to xt plus one is a bit complicated because it depends on this acceptance ratio. And sometimes we just stay where we are, right? So uh, sometimes we just stay where we are, which is this one, or sometimes we do a jump to a candidate. And now what exactly the transition probability will be, yeah, so that's the question. So what exactly will be this, uh, let's, I don't forgot what letter I'm using, but now let's use the P. So what exactly this, this thing is, we will show on one of the following sides. However, that's really non-trivial to come up with an expression for that one, because this probability is defined by a little algorithm that we wrote down on the slide here, okay? Okay, more, a bit more practical notes here. Practical note here is as, how do we start? We, we start basically by um, by starting with x0 arbitrarily. Right? It could be anything. Right? So you can sample from, for example, from q where you say my current point is zero, whatever. It doesn't matter if your proposal distribution really covers all the space. The good thing about MCMC is in every iteration I get a new sample. Ah. I didn't write the word new. In every iteration, I get a sample. So I go once through MC and I get a new sample. However, sometimes the new sample is the old sample. Okay. Nonetheless, that is a Markov chain, but it just means that at some locations, I'm just staying there and creating it more often. And of course, that means something for the distribution that I get afterwards. But one can show that this is exactly the right thing to do to then to converge kind of against the right distribution. So that's part of it. Then there's a so-called burn-in phase. That's also like a terminus technicus from the MCMC world, which basically says something um, at the beginning, maybe we are starting um, <clears throat> elsewhere, right? We are starting maybe Maybe here's a zero and that's our starting point and we draw a Gaussian distribution and kind of jump around here and these samples they are not very good. So it might take a while until I'm really getting over here, but it will happen if basically here's some non-zero value which has a gradient towards this bump. Then this gradient will drag me to this bump, right? If it's perfectly zero over here, so this P star then I have no chance kind of to leave. I don't have at all information how to get there. By the way, here you see a really kind of similarity to optimization. In optimization, I'm interested in finding the maximum, either that or that one. And if I start somewhere, I need to be dragged to that one by looking at the gradient. And that's kind of similar thing here. I'm dragged to that one if there are small differences between uh, of these P stars. So if I would put like a... Um, make it much larger, then there should be some gradient. So it should go up a little bit the density. So it's a little bit more likely that I jump to the right than I jump to the left, or that I accept jumping to the right more often than I accept jumping to the left, okay? However, the burn-in phase now means that after a while now, I'm in the area where I'm really doing the stuff that is relevant for the PDF. And at the beginning, I'm spending lots of time at an arbitrary location. 
and those samples should be ignored. So they should be cut off. Now comes the super price question. So how long does the burn-in phase take? So how long should you wait? Unfortunately, you never know, right? You never know how long it takes. It de just depends on the function where you apply it to. It's the same question as um, how should I do the split in cross-validation? That's also one of these questions that it's very hard to to um, uh, answer. Or if I have a neural network with that many parameters, how much data do I need to train it? This kind of question, how long is the burn-in phase? Okay, it's a quite similar question. Okay, so they are discarded at the beginning. Okay, great, so far so good. So maybe let's, let's look at the code right away. Then you have an uh, interruption before the mass comes. So here comes the Metropolis method. So this is my unnormalized density and I'm following again the book of David Mackay. So here's a very nice chapter 29 where he's basically going through the same stuff or let's say it's the other way around. I'm following David Mackay's book here in this presentation, okay? However, the implementations are along his book. So maybe those are some exercises in his book. So I have a P star function which can calculate an unnormalized PDF. Then I have a Gaussian distribution here, this um, quantity. This is also the PDF of the Gaussian distribution. And that is the Q of X prime comma X. So that's a, the PDF of the proposal distribution. And then I have the proposal distribution, which is now sampling from it, okay? So this is now sampling from the distribution where the variance is fixed. And I'm sampling with a certain mean. And now here comes the metropolis step. So I generate a new candidate, okay? So that's my new candidate, starting from X0. Then I'm calculating my acceptance ratio. If my acceptance ratio is greater or equal than one, I just say, great, X1 is accepted. If it's not, then I throw a coin and check whether it's smaller than my acceptance ratio. If it is smaller, then, okay, X1 is accepted as an exception, okay? So I accepted it with a certain probability. And otherwise I just return the X zero. So here's no loop or anything going on. It just goes through once and you have a new sample. Okay, and then I have some metropolis plot. Um, don't worry about it. So this makes a nice pretty plot as you can see in a second. Um, so let's reset our metropolis sampler by making the list of samples to zero. And for plotting purposes, I again sample some number, some uniform distribution below the P star. So to like to get like a nice visual visualization of the samples that I have. And I sample from my proposal distribution here to get like an initial starting point. And like I always have these sample Y coordinate just for visualization. Okay, so let's do that. So that was that one. Now it's reset it and let's sample once. So why does it take so long? Okay, so here we sampled now one. So let's look at the plot. So what I did was I did a metropolis step starting with the last one. And for visualization purposes, I sample a Y coordinate, but in this implementation, it's irrelevant. It's just there for plotting. And then I plot it. Okay, so this is my starting po uh, point X zero. I have a Gaussian distribution located at it. Okay, so that is where I'm now sampling my new data point, which is X1, okay? And X1 has, in this case, a much larger P star, so the ratio will be one, so it will be definitely accepted. Okay, let's iterate, let's do it again. So here comes the second one. Now I'm putting my Gaussian distribution at my new location, so the X1 becomes X0, and I sample a new point. And in this case now, this new sample point has a smaller P star, okay? However, it has a P star, which is like, let's say, whatever, two third, or let's say this is like height three and this is height five. So it's like with three fifths probability, I nonetheless accept it, okay? And in this case, I accepted it. And another one, and another one, and another one. And so I could go on now and fill all of this below with samples. And so I have a list, uh, I have an iteration that does it. So let's run it. And as you can see, it fills nicely the curve that I want to sample from. And of course, the height is irrelevant for Metropolis here, it's just for visualization. But it kind of shows you that it's kind of like everywhere kind of the same bluish 
tone here, okay? So it works very well. By the way, the last one was an example of staying, okay? So here the title says stayed. That means it sampled a new one, but um, it didn't uh, accept it. So probably the new one was over here on the left-hand side and it was not accepted. And so the X2 was the X1 and it stayed where it is. So that probably happens with 50-50 when you are on one of the boundaries here. Good, so far so good. Let's move on to the Metropolis hasting methods. So there was now um, the word symmetric, which I didn't say much about it, but I, the, the proposal distribution for the Metropolis method needed to be symmetric, where symmetry means that basically you can exchange the roles of X and X prime. Or with other words, jumping from X to X prime is as likely as jumping from X prime to X, okay? So basically going back or forth has the same probability. Um, the Metropolis Hastings method, having a new author Hastings, as far as I know, that's a new author, author um, now got rid of this assumption and also allowing now asymmetric proposal distributions, which is generalizing the method and giving you more variability. So you can now try more different proposal distributions. And the only change that you need to make is you need to change the acceptance ratio and also put these probabilities in here. So that's it. Okay, and then the asymmetry is, then it's fine if it's asymmetric. And it's kind of intuitively makes sense because it almost looks like the product rule that you wrote here, right? And it's like having the joint distribution of X and X prime and X prime and X, kind of, and you're comparing those as a pair. Okay, and then it doesn't matter whether you go back or forth. Anyway, the rest stays the same. So, question. Metropolis is a special case of Metropolis Hastings, right? You see that typically already from the name, but why? Why is it a special case? Any, any one of you knows? So why is Metropolis a special case of Metropolis Hastings? Any, anyone knows? You can put it into the chat. Um, the reason I tell you, okay, so maybe you're all so shy today. So the reason being, now suppose you have a symmetric um, distribution, right? Then you have equality, and if you have equality, the last term just cancels out, okay? So if you have Metropolis Hastings for a symmetric proposal distribution, you end up with the Metropolis method, okay? So that's it. That, of course, makes a nice exam question, right? So is the Metropolis Hastings method a special case of Metropolis or the other way around, right? Or is it a special case of important sampling? or is it a special case of whatever sampling, okay? So this kind of stuff can happen in the exam. So now let's see why does it work, okay? So let's first look at an intuition. I tried to give you already a little bit of intuition, so which is now written down as words as well, right? So in a way, the sampler should find X primes where the P star of X prime is large, right? So it should sample from the PDF, so it, spend, it should spend time where the P star of X is large. So it should spend time over here and it should spend time over there, right? So now to push it into the right direction, yeah, we will accept a candidate for sure if my new P star of X prime is larger than the other one, right? So that was the one with the minimum of one comma the ratio. And so for those candidates where I'm kind of going uphill in the density, those are the ones I always accept. However, with a certain probability, I also go downhill. And this is particularly important. So suppose um, this bump here is smaller than the other one. Now in optimization, it would mean following the gradient that you end up here at a local optimum, okay? However, in the MCMC method, you want to, guarantee, you want to be guaranteed that you reach also the other one, okay? And, and so sometimes you also have to go downhill and then go uphill again, okay? Of course, this is now fun, right? So does it solve global optimization? Does it mean now I should use some MC, MCMC stuff for deep learning, right? To find like the best optimum. Maybe, maybe that's a super clever choice. Um, yes, of course, think about it. Yeah, of course, maybe you find a new, new method. However, there is already some stochasticity in the gradient descent for deep learning. As you know, people are using stochastic gradient descent, right? And stochastic gradient descent is also accepting sometimes possibly a step where the global 
function is going down. However, for some random weird looking cat image, maybe it's good to go that direction, but the overall function might go down. So there's also this randomness in there. So in a way, the deep learning, the SGD, the stochastic gradient descent for deep learning is also a randomized method. So it's also in a way a Monte Carlo method, right? Because you're randomly picking your data points. But the idea is very good. And of course, one could think um, of some MCMC method, which is super successful, whether it can be translated into the optimization world, right? Okay, otherwise with probability alpha, yeah, we might accept also a bad point, okay? So that is giving us enough variability then. So let's look at it more formally. So first of all, um, there are two inputs to our Metropolis Hastings. So there's the um, true distribution we care for and how is it given? It's given as a function, right? And then there's the, a sampler that allows us to sample from a proposal distribution. So those are the two inputs. Let's try to define or let's try to write down the transition probabilities xt to xt plus one. Okay, so this one over here should get the letter H. So that's kind of confusing, but when you look in, in mathemat mathematical statistics book for densities and stuff, people using any letters, right? So any letters can be used, not just the P. So let's try to define that. And that is now a little bit complicated step here. So let's go through it. First of all, there's a case distinction, right? So given that I'm at a certain location, what's the probability of ending up at xt plus one? So one case is where my xt plus one is really a new point, okay? And it's not the old one, but it's a new one. So that's one where I accepted the, the current point. And then there's the case where I'm staying, okay? So let's first look at the case where I'm picking a new point. So what's, how do I get a new point? Of course, my xt plus one has been sampled from my proposal distribution, right? So that is part of this expression. So if my xt plus one is very unlikely under my proposal distribution, of course, this expression should influence the transition probability. And then the probability that I really have accepted it um, is exactly the alpha where the alpha could be one, right? Since it's a minimum of one comma the other number, or it's a smaller number. So this distinction here is different from saying that the alpha is greater one or smaller one. It is, the distinction is about whether I get a new point or not. And so when I get a new point, it could either be the case that the alpha was larger than one and I had to accept it, but that's fine. Then the factor is just one. Or it might be like a number like a half or something, right? With which then luckily I accepted also a, a worse number. So that is the first expression over here. Now, what about the other ones? So first of all, note that this, the, the, the other way around would be that I jump to another point. So I have an X prime that is different from XT. However, I haven't accepted it. So the, the probability that that happens is it is the probability of jumping to x prime times one minus the acceptance probability. So that is the probability that I am at x prime, okay, but I haven't accepted it, okay? So that is this probability. However, there are many choices for the x prime. So in principle, sampling from a Gaussian distribution, I could end up anywhere, like on the whole spectrum. So I need to sum up all these values. And that is the integration here over all dx. So for all possible locations, yeah, there's also, if, if I'm, I stayed at my current point, basically I rejected all my proposal points, okay? So staying at the same point basically means that I rejected all other points, okay? And they are mutually exclusive, so I can add them up or I can integrate over them, okay? So I basically here go over all other possibilities that the x prime could have been, and I'm just integrating over them. Okay, remains the first part here. So what is the first part? So this looks strange. So that is just that it can happen that by chance, yeah, my xt plus one is equal to xt and I just sampled it again. So my proposal distribution just exactly sampled the xt. So that can happen. And that is a case that we try to cover in the first line. However, here I was assuming that they are different. So I need to include the case where they are the same and I'm taking the xt plus one 
from my proposal distribution, I need to include it into the second case. Okay. However, when you want to understand this formula, first ignore the first term. First, first understand that you need to multiply these two probabilities. And that basically means that in case you do not take the one that was proposed, do it for an X prime. And then it's Q times one minus alpha, of course. Yeah. And, but there are many X primes possible. So you need to integrate them out. Okay, so that's basically it. And then comes the case, okay, but what about the one if I'm hitting the point itself and I'm accepting it, okay? Okay, so that's now a mathematical description of the transition probability. So this thing really defines the Markov chain, okay? Okay, let's go on. What can we do with it? So by now we have three probability distributions here. We have the wanted distribution P star, okay? Then we have the proposal distribution and now the latest greatest transition distribution h of x prime given x. Or maybe I should have written h of x t plus one given x t, okay? And that one is defined in terms of the procedure from Metropolis Hastings paper uh, and um, the parameters p star and q, okay? So now what we need to show is for the, um, oh, let me first say, so now to show that my Markov chain really generates samples from P star, I need to show the so-called detailed Banner's condition, okay? So that is a technical lemma that I need to show. Let's look at it. It basically says, starting with a certain distribution, in this case with the true distribution, even normalized, so I drop the star, okay? And then transitioning elsewhere with my Markov chain from the metropolis Hastings method, that has the same probability as starting at x star and transitioning the other way around. So the detailed balance condition says that if I have two samples, the probability of this being the first, that the second, and the other way around is the same. Okay, that's a lemma. Of course, you don't know why, why is the detailed balance useful. Okay, so let's see what we can do with it. So if we have the detailed balance, we can show that the p of x is a stationary distribution of our Markov chain. So that basically means if you have a Markov chain, yeah, think of a frog jumping around some leaves in a big lake. Yeah, so that's the Markov chain. It only depends where the frog on which leaf it is, where the next leaf is. And then the stationary distribution is if you have a hundred lakes and you let the frogs jump, then the distribution where you see the frog after 1000 steps on these leaves, that is the stationary distribution at the end. So basically where it converges against. So, and um, that can be also written as basically saying, so let's integrate out from this distribution P of X times H X prime. This can be viewed as a joint distribution of X prime and X and then integrating out the X. Okay, so basically the resulting distribution, but integrated out over all inputs. And it turns out that that is exactly the same as P of X prime. So how can we see it? Okay, under the integration now we use a detailed balance and plug it in. So we basically exchange the roles of X and X prime, but we don't change the role at the DX, so only the expression in there. Okay, the P of X prime does not depend on the integration, so we can drag it out. And we have an integration of a transition probability in the first argument, where the first argument is, of course, where we have a probability distribution over. So the integration here is just equal to one. And what we get out of this is that this is the distribution of X prime. So what I've showed you here now is basically that P of X is a stationary distribution of this Markov chain, okay? That has been shown by this equation. Why exactly, if you want to have more and more and more detail, then you have to do more reading on Markov chains, okay? But this is basically the essential step why the detailed balance is good. In order to really show convergence of our Markov chain, we need some other property, some weird word which you might have never heard, ergodicity. So that's a word from statistics which tells us some properties of stochastic processes. And there are things like, I think, that, that, that it cannot happen that the frog jumps from one lake into another lake and it will never come back to the previous one and these kind of things. So a certain connectedness of the state space so that there's a probability to get from every point to every other point. So that's ergodicity. 
and some other properties. Okay, it's a more for me, my perspective, it's a more technical thing. Okay, but it's beyond the scope of, of this lecture. So this should give you the intuition jumping forward and backward. That's what you need to show when you have that everything is fine. So what does it mean? Now, if you are a new inventor of an MCMC method, you have to show detailed balance and then you can say the rest some other mathematicians have done. Yeah. So if you come up with a new Metropolis Hastings and now I could read one of your names, okay, method, yeah, then you need to show for this algorithm, you need to derive the transition probability H, okay. So this thing follows from your code that you wrote and for this implementation, then you need to show the detailed balance. Okay, let's do that now for Metropolis Hastings. So first of all, the detailed balance holds immediately for x equals x prime. Okay, then, then there's nothing to show. What about x is not equal to x prime? Now you see why I made this case distinction in the definition of h, because I made the case distinction in such a way that I can use it here yeah, very easily now. So let's start with the p of x, like with the left-hand side, and let's plug in the definition of my transition probability for the case x being not equal to x prime. Okay, so I just plugged it in. Then I plug in the definition of the alpha, which is this minimum of this quotient. And then I need to make sure, okay, this factor here is a positive number, it's greater or equal to zero. So I can drag it in into the minimum and I drag it into the one and I drag it into the second term and in the second term, it just cancels out. So I get this very symmetric looking minimum. Now I'm exchanging the locations of the entries and I'm doing the same thing, but now I'm excluding the P of X prime times Q of X given X prime. So just the other term, okay? And then I've shown the detailed balance. So that's it, okay? So it's, it's really easy if you have the right case distinction, but be assured like Metropolis, I think Metropolis is, is he, maybe I might be an author name. So Metropolis and Hastings, they had to, to go through, so they were maybe PhD students like you are or something, and they really tried lots of different things until they figured it out, how exactly to do it. Because they need to define a function such that the mass at the end works, okay? So they define a function, the mass doesn't work. Then from the mathematics, they get an intuition how they should change their function. They change the function again, the mass doesn't work. And so they need to iterate back and forth until they get it right. Now it all looks simple, but of course at the beginning it's difficult. Great, by the way, we replaced here in the alpha, we replaced the P star, which we actually have, we replace it with P, yeah, which is allowed since the normalization constant cancels. Yeah? You see these unnormalized distributions are fine if all our methods are doing, are, is looking at quotients, right? If we look at quotients, the unnormalized, um, as in the normalization constant doesn't play a role. Okay, so that is um, Metropolis Hastings. Let's look at other examples of Markov chain Monte Carlo of these kind of um, things where we have particular proposal distributions. So there are two candidates here. One is called Gibbs sampling and the other one is called slice sampling. Okay, let's first look at Gibbs sampling. So Gibbs sampling, the presentation can be super confusing. So I try to be the least confusing on this slide. Yeah. So after you've seen that one, have a look at other explanations and ideally then you understand both. However, I think this is a simple way to start. First of all, you could introduce Gibbs sampling right away for lots of variables. I think that's not a good idea. Then it gets really messy. So first look at the simplest case, only two variables. Now, the goal is we want to get samples from a two dimensional space, okay? And let's say we have a joint distribution of this two dimensional space but it's very difficult to sample from it. Okay, so that is our P star by basically, right? However, suppose that it's super easy to sample from a conditional distribution like this. And that is basically saying, I'm at a certain point and I'm holding one coordinate fixed and sampling the other one. So visually, um, that basically means, um, Now here I'm having my 2D space and I want to sample from it. And let's say I'm already at a certain location here, but it's very hard to sample from this 2D distribution, but it's easy to sample from this distribution where I'm assuming, okay, so this coordinate is now fixed and now I'm just sampling from um, 
p of x1 given x2. So that's easy. Okay, great. So then I will sample from that one. And next, I'm sampling from the other way around. So it will be p of x2, x1, which might end up over here. And then so on and so forth. So basically, I'm having something like this. And I'm always updating one of the coordinates, okay? So that's basically the idea of Gibbs sampling. And maybe, more almost. So like this. Ah, you get the idea. Always updating one coordinate. And it could be, for example, now easily generalized, right, this idea. Let's say you have 100, um, 100 coordinates, you keep 99 fixed and you're just updating one, okay? I think an example is also somewhere given in, in David Mackay's book, of course, but I think you can also use it for um, sampling from GPs and stuff like that, where you keep everything fixed, but you can sample from one of them, and then you sample from another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, okay? And that's the idea of Gibbs sampling. Okay, so now how is it an MCMC method? Of course, it is an MCMC method. We are looking at the previous data point, and that is already fixing one of the parameters. So that means that the proposal distribution Q here is either we are updating x1 or we are updating x2. So when we are updating x1, then we could write the proposal distribution as follows. So we say the proposal distribution is only one if I keep my second coordinate constant. Okay, that's why I put the Iverson bracket here. Okay, so my proposal distribution is zero for all possibilities where x2 is changing. That's why there's x2 minus x2 prime. And then for the first coordinate, I'm just sampling given the second coordinate. Okay, so that is the proposal distribution where I'm just updating the first entry. Then there's a proposal distribution that is just updating the second entry, okay? And then by alternatingly doing this, now I'm already getting a bit more general than the metropolis hasting because I don't have a single um, proposal distribution, but now I have two proposal distributions. But you can probably imagine that the MCMC can be generalized to several proposal distributions that you kind of use like in a round robin fashion or something. Good, so those are our proposal distributions. Um, let's calculate the acceptance ratio. And the curious thing here for Gibbs sampling is that the acceptance ratio is always one. Okay, by doing this proposal distributions, I'm always accepting a new sample, which is super nice. So let's see why that's the case. So the acceptance ratio now is our P star divided by the P star of my candidate point and then multiplied now with my proposal distribution going back and going forth. But I'm just showing it for Q1, but you can do the same thing for Q2. Let's plug everything in. First of all, let's use the product rule for the joint distribution and replace it by P of X2 times P of X1, blah, blah, blah. And um, let's plug in for the Q1, let's plug in the expression. Now, I'm dragging out here the Iverson bracket and end up with the P of X1 prime given X2. Now, at the bottom part, I have the same thing. And here the x2 minus x2 prime is um, gone. The reason being, first of all, do we have a division by zero? Um, no, we shouldn't. Otherwise, the acceptance ratio already had a division by zero. So if the q is not zero, it means that also the x2 minus x2 prime is not zero. So here I'm already assuming that the x2 and x2 prime is equal. Yeah. So otherwise, I couldn't write it down. And then notice that the quotient of two Iverson brackets of the same statement is the same as, so if I have a statement F, which is true or false, and divide by this one, yeah, then that's exactly the same as that one. However, a bit fishy is here. What if the F is wrong, right? So this thing only holds for F being true. Well, then the whole thing gets trivial, right? But I'm just saying where the terms disappear. So that's why basically here now, um, the term that I get from the bottom Q1 disappeared, okay? So let's look at the rest. First of all, let's. I want to cancel um, this term with 
the one at the bottom right. However, the, here's an x2 and here's an x2 prime. However, I know that x2 and x2 prime are equal. So that's why the term over here and the one at the bottom right cancels out and the same for the other remaining term. Okay, then x2 and x2 prime is the same. So also the first quotient is equal to one and Iverson bracket is also equal to one. So I end up with a one. Okay, so the acceptance ratio is one. So I never sidestepping in the Gibbs sampling. So Gibbs sampling is a Metropolis Hastings method, which always accepts, okay, which is a really nice property. If I have several variables, everything gets a bit more messy. However, similarly, I can write down the proposal distributions. Yeah. For updating only the first entry, I having Ivers and brackets for all other entries and so on and so forth. And again, one can show that all acceptance ratios are equal to one. Okay. However, the reasoning and everything gets a bit more messy, but it's just more terms and it's a bit more confusing with primes and sub indices, but it's, it's nothing more. Great. So that's Gibbs sampling. So that's a curious one. Here comes another one. Um, so this looks a bit like Gibbs sampling, like I'm going in 2D. However, notice first, so this is another method. So we left Gibbs sampling behind. Let's look at another one. Um, this is looking a bit like Gibbs sampling, like jumping around like that. However, um, notice that this is the axis of X, but this is not the axis of X2. So this is again now the probability distribution. Okay, so now what is the slice sampling doing? So the slice sampling is starting at a certain location and it's yet another MCMC method. So how does the proposal distribution look like? The proposal distribution looks like this. When you are at a certain location, yeah, you are looking for an interval to the left and the right, which is like this dotted line. And then the dotted line should have the property that the boundary X L and XR are beyond my P star. So they are outside of the P star. Then from this line, I'm sampling uniformly a random number. So it could be any of these points and I go on. Okay. However, it could happen that I'm jumping outside. If I'm jumping outside, I need to make the interval a little bit smaller and try again. Okay. So once I have a new point, I'm also jumping now up. So here sampling in the y direction is relevant for the slice sampling. Okay. And then I go on. So the fun thing here is that if I'm down here where I'm very wide, yeah, then I'm basically can jump around to all locations equally likely. And then I'm jumping up again and spend some time depending on the height of the bump. But at certain times I go down again and make a big jump again. So let me draw you a nice distribution on the board where this might be a super trick. So this is my X and let's say this is now my P star of X and let's say it looks like this. So it's going up and then it's going down and up and down and up and down and up and down like this. So this is a pretty tough case, right? So in optimization, you would get stuck in one of the optima. However, with the slice sampling, you might start over here and you jump in here. Then you go left and you go maybe like this and go further. And suddenly you're again down here. And next time you jump into this one and you spend some time and then you jump back and you spend some time here. So it's like randomly jumping around horizontally and vertically. Okay, super creative. I think it's it's really interesting. And it's like sampling in slice, it's like slicing the whole density. Yeah? So I, I guess that's where the name comes from. <clears throat> of course, the procedure I described to you is pretty complicated. However, in the paper on slice sampling, the authors had to show uh, this procedure of doing this fancy jumping around that I show you in a second fulfills the detailed balance. And once they show that, then everything is fine and everybody trusts the slice sampler and they can also run experiments. Good. So here's slice sampling for one variable. So in 1D, so this is one dimension here. So the Gibbs sampling was in higher dimensional, but the slice sampling here is in 1D. However, there are versions of this also in higher dimensions. So again, our goal is to generate samples from an unnormalized PDF. 
And I just copied the code box from David Mackay's excellent book. Okay, so it's from section 29.7. So how does it work? So how does the implementation look like? So first of all, I evaluate my P of X. So I want to want to know the height. And then I draw a vertical co coordinate as we've done already for visualization. So I draw a vertical Y and jump somewhere into the hill, for example. Next, I'm generating my horizontal interval in such a way that the X is enclosed. So the X should be on the interval and my interval should be beyond the lines of the densities. So how to do this, we will see on the next slide. So there is a way to generate this interval. Let's assume we have one already, okay? So let's say we have already the interval, which is like extending beyond the bumps. Then we sample uniformly from this interval, evaluate the function value if we are too large, uh, if we are, if the function value is larger than our sampled one over here, then we are done. And otherwise, I kind of stepped out of the density and I need to modify the interval, basically shrinking it and making it a little bit smaller. <clears throat> so let's understand, first of all, this code. And I try to, again, draw another picture for you. <clears throat> so let's take that one and let's say... Um, Right now we are at X, so this is my location X, okay? And I'm vertically sampling from this one. I think you can still see it in the corner, but it's very small, but yeah, maybe you can still read it. <clears throat> so I'm sampling from this vertical interval, some random number, which will be my vertical coordinate U prime, okay? So that is, that is U prime, okay? Now, next, I need to create a horizontal interval. <clears throat> Ideally, that would be the perfect one. I just want to make sure that everything is included. So I make it with a simple algorithm, just a little bit larger. Okay, so this will be my x left, and I have an x right. And as you can see, it is a little bit too large, but that's fine. It just need to enclose the x and everything that is kind of from the density. So. Next, I'm drawing a random sample point from, from this interval, for example, that one. So that would be x prime. Now, I evaluate my point. So that one up here was p star of x. And this one is p star of x prime. I evaluate it. Okay, and if my p star of x prime is larger than the u prime, which is this one over here. So this is the u prime. If I'm larger, yeah, then I'm done and I found a good sample x prime. <clears throat> However, it could happen that I'm not so lucky, but I'm jumping out of this one and that's my x prime. In this case, I'm over here with my p star x prime and that is smaller than the u. So the weird thing is here that I'm comparing the p star x prime with the u However, that exactly tells me whether I'm outside or inside of this bump. Okay, that's a bit cumbersome. But when you go through the steps and you draw a picture, you see, okay, sure. So the x is inside of this inter, so the, the x where I'm starting is inside and I'm having the u prime. And then basically I need to compare the u prime whether my functional value of the p star is smaller. So that's how I'm getting this area and that area. Or whether it's larger, that is basically the inside from which I want to sample, okay? So if I'm unlucky and I'm out here, I need to modify. And the modification basically means I'm making it smaller. So my XL will be getting closer. However, for shrinking the interval, kind of I'm using a quite core strategy. So it can happen that the interval gets too short, but as it turns out, um, that's fine. So it still works. Okay, so let's look at the two things. How do I create a horizontal interval? And how do I modify the interval? Also for that, there are code boxes from David Mackay's book. So this is a stepping out procedure and the steps three A, B, C, D, E are now detailing basically the step three. Okay, so that is step C, A, B. So how do I do it? 
how do I get my interval? So basically I'm saying I'm having already <clears throat> given some W, which is giving me some overall scaling. So I'm here at U prime and let's say I'm having a W which I've chosen. Let's say this is W. Okay. So this length is W. Then I'm randomly sampling, um, in this case, um, a number between zero and one, and I'm going like scaled with W, I'm going to the left. So it might be like 60% of the W I'm going to this side and that is giving me my X left. Okay, so it's X minus 0 0.6 times W. So I'm end, end up over there, okay. And then I'm doing the same thing on the other side and I'm going 40% of the W to the other side. So maybe just out of curiosity only towards that one. Okay, so that's like a, the initialization. And then I'm again asking this weird question. So is my P star at my new location, yeah? Is it larger or smaller than my U prime? So if it's smaller, I'm happy, right? Because I wanted to have an XL which is outside of this bump. So as long as it's still larger, I'm, I'm still too small and I'm in this area, okay? And in that case, I'm just making the interval smaller and smaller and smaller. So I'm jumping out and I'm doing it very coarsely with steps of W. So the left hand side is fine. But the right hand side is, is bad. So here the, the P star of X is larger than the U prime. And so I'm just adding another W, which is super coarse. So I end up over here. Okay. So it's just a heuristic kind of to, to get a good interval here. And then I'm fine. Great. And something bad, of course, could also happen. So it could be that there's a bump like this and things could be really weird. But as it turns out, if you follow this procedure, <clears throat> um, you end up with an interval with the right properties at some point. And then you take that one to uniformly sample from it. Again, you check whether you are inside or inside or outside and you accept it or you go on and you decrease the interval again. So this complicated thing, of course, also implies um, this procedure that ex I explained to you, yeah, it is also implying, let's draw a really long line, some transition probabilities H of xt plus one, given that I'm x, xt. So this procedure, this computer program, or this description, this recipe with extending the intervals and doing uniform sampling and blah, 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 it allows us also kind of to derive an expression ideally for the age of xt plus one given xt plus uh, xt but and for that expression then we need to show the detailed balance and then we can trust slice sampling okay however it's super complicated yeah okay so far so good so that is slice sampling um, and that's how it looks like i show you the code as well so <clears throat> Here's the code. This is basically the implementation where I'm exactly following these steps from Mackay's book. I give it the same numberings and you can look at the implementation and then it's also doing some nice plotting. So it's showing you all these different lines. Okay. And you can iterate through them. So you can really, you can start again, you reset it and then you can start with the first one and it goes on and on and it always shows you the intervals from which it's sampled. Okay, so it shows you all the stuff and you can step by step go through the code to see it. So those are exactly implementing the steps. Uh, those are exactly implementing the steps that I showed you on the slides. And then when you run it a thousand times, you also get like nice samples from it. Okay, so this is slice sampling. Slice sampling is already kind of a sophisticated method. So far, so good. Um, let's move on to our last topic. So that would be a very interesting MCMC paper. I come, I, I came to, how, how did I find out about it? I found out about it since I'm a fan of Percy Diaconis. So Percy Diaconis, he's a Stanford professor with a super interesting CV. He's a pro professional magician who dropped out of school with 16 or something. And um, then having, starting a little career as a magician, like in the US and 
so I'm, that's a short version, which is partially wrong, but it should whetten your appetite to, appetite to read more about him. And um, he did some um, card tricks and all different stuff to, to make a living out of it. And one of his colleagues gave him at some point in a book from Feller, who's a famous statistician, and said, so some super cool tricks need probability series, so you should read about it. And so he started reading about it and didn't understand the word properly at the beginning, but then getting more and more into it, finally ending up in some, I guess, some community college or some college where he started studying mathematics. And at some point he was at Harvard and making a PhD and like were considered like a super genius in all these areas and became finally Stanford professor for statistics. And the curious thing is, He's in this image, you see already that he's a quite curious guy and he's showing us here a coin. Um, the reason being not only that he can do all these coin tricks and palming and this kind of stuff, but he also does really interesting research. So on the one hand, he's like a super tough mathematician who really uses some abstract geometry stuff to show results in statistics. But on the other hand, he's still a magician and he's interested in basic questions. So. He's the guy who wrote a paper on the riffle shuffle, right? Which is like these shuffle where you shuffle the cards like on a table and you do it seven times. And then you can prove that all permutations are equally likely. And this paper has been written by Pesi Diakonis. And he also has some recent work and there are some YouTube videos from him where he discusses the probability of throwing coins. And so he also made experiments with throwing coins, let people throw coins, measuring the speed, how fast it's turning, the height, and then making a diagram, what's the probability of heads and coins, or whether it's better to throw it and let it fall on the ground, or whether it's better to, to catch it and put it onto your hand. So he analyzed all of these things, and there are some interesting facts about it, and it's interesting to analyze anyway. So there are lots of interesting papers from him. There's also a very nice book, which I always advertise, so I don't get any money, but I really like it a lot. So it's this one, Magical Mathematics, so it's a really fun book where there's some nice card tricks in there and um, they really are quite amazing, but they have also have some interesting math behind it. Anyway, so if I see a paper from Pesi Diakonis, I always try to look at it. Some of them are just too tough on the mathematical side from, for me, but some of them, they are readable. And so this is an, a nice example that was readable for me, at least the beginning. So I show you the paper. First of all, it has a cool title. It's called Markov Chain Monte Carlo Revolution. And it right away starts with something where you think, wow, this is interesting, encryption, right? And so this is a story where there's some, some text from the state prison yeah, in, in San Francisco probably, and the statistics department had to figure out what is written here, okay? And then he used to, using here Markov chain Monte Carlo to decrypt it. And here comes the text. So go into the paper, then you can read the text what these guys are writing in, in these American prisons. And he has a brief treatise on Markov chains afterwards. So you wet, the, your appetite is wet, wetten. So you really want to know how to do this, how to do this decryption. But of course, first you need to read a bit on Markov chains. And I will go through with, with you through this stuff in a minute. And then at the end, it gets a bit more complicated. So then he starts, okay, by the way, there's an interesting link from cryptography to symmetric function theory. And then it's really getting tougher and tougher. And it's getting really into deep mathematics. And there are some curious things along the way, like placing n disks of radius epsilon in the unit square, how to do it right. And some really interesting links to things where you think, yes, I'm interested in it. But then in between the mathematics again is quite challenging and quite tough. However, this is like having for me the right mixture of like keeping you like um, curious because there are so interesting examples. On the other hand, between being frustrated by not knowing what this symmetric function theory is and this kind of stuff. But it's like an, an interesting thing. So to, to go through this like uh, tough mathematics and as you can see, it goes on and on and on and it's, it's a lot of math. Nonetheless, so let's start, start at the beginning for us and let's see what I can tell you about it. So uh, what he's doing here is, he's um, giving us, first of all, here a brief treatise on Markov chain. So, Let's see how what notation he's using. So first of all, he considers only different uh, finitely many states. 
By the way, what were these states in our world here? The states was basically the axis x and for us it was always continuous. So we were talking about integrals and all of these and we had a Markov chain on the real line basically, right? Or in the R to the N. Here we are talking about a Markov chain on finitely many states. So why might this be a good idea for encryption? Okay, in encryption, you have a finite alphabet, right? And you are looking for a code. So you're basically on the space of all possible codes yeah, to replace letters with a symbol or something. So that's what it will be at the end. And there are 26 letters. So there are not so many possibilities how to kind of scramble this stuff, okay? So finally, many states kind of make sense. And um, curiously then, a Markov chain can be written with a matrix K. Right, so we have a matrix K, which has entries K of X comma Y. So that might be a bit um, strange notation. We typically use K sub X, Y, but in this paper you use this with round brackets, which is fine. And how is the Markov chain now defined by this matrix? So basically the entries of the matrix are the transition probabilities. So they are all entries greater than zero. And if you sum up um, a row, okay, so keeping X fixed, and summing up a whole row, you get a one. So basically the, each row in the matrix is telling us, given that we are in state X, what's the transition probability to go into the state Y? Okay, so the K is basically capturing the whole transition um, probabilities. And of course this defines a chain, right? And it is also a Markov chain. So we can work out the probabilities. Um, so given that I am at a certain location X, in the next step, being in Y, then the probability that this is happening can be just read off from my matrix. If I'm at the beginning in X0, then the probability of first stepping to Y and then stepping to Z is basically now multiplying the entry XY with the entry YZ. Okay, so far so good. Now if I integrate out the X1 from this equation over here, I have to sum out all the possibilities for y, right? So I don't care for where I'm in between. I only care for that I start at x and I end up after two steps at z. And if you work it out, basically you are summing out these ones. Now, what is this expression meaning? So for us computer scientists, this is matrix, matrix multiplication, right? So you keep basically the row of the first one and you iterate over all columns of the first matrix K here. And then here you iterate over all rows of your matrix K and you pick only one column of it. So this is a matrix matrix multiplication. So with other words, to calculate the general probability of X0 and X2 is just multiplying K by K. And curiously now we are in linear algebra, right? Even further, if you want to have the transition probability after n steps, basically you are having a matrix, 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 matrix multiplication. Yeah, n fold times the k after the other. So that's kind of curious that in finitely many states, the Markov chains have a lot to do with linear algebra. So that's kind of interesting. Now, what about eigenvectors and eigenvalues? Speaking of matrices, there are always the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and they play here a particular role. So the stationary distribution that we've seen before was basically saying, so starting at a certain X and going to Y, so that would be the joint distribution. What if I integrate out my starting distribution and sum out all possibilities here? Then a definition of the stationary distribution basically says that if I do this, I end up with the same distribution. Now the pi is a distribution over a finite state, so the pi now is a vector, okay? And curiously, the pi is a left eigenvector of my matrix K, and it has eigenvalue one. Okay, so here's another interesting relation. Maybe when you start with linear algebra, everything is super painful, but then, and then comes the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and maybe Hauptachsen transformation, but they have super interesting meanings, okay? And this, in Markov chain theory, there is another interesting meaning out there. Good, and then there's the fundamental theorem. So I'm just going with you through the content of the first section. So that is the first insight that the eigenvectors are the stationary distributions. And then if you have, uh, oh, by the way, that, that fits nicely. 
or maybe let's first go into the fundamental theorem. So there's a theorem that if you iterate, basically, if you multiply the k with each other for a long time, yeah, then you end up with the distribution, with the stationary distribution, okay, for any x, doesn't matter where you start. And that is curious that this is a fundamental theorem on Markov chain. In numerics, this would be the theorem that if you multiply a matrix which itself, you will end up with an eigenvector. Okay, so starting from any vector and mapping it with a matrix, lots of times you will end up with an eigenvector. Okay, so starting with a vector v and then multiplying a matrix in front of it, you will end up with an eigenvector. That's and that's an algorithm called the power method. Okay, so it's a numerical method to find the eigenvector to the largest eigenvalue. And curiously, it also kind of has a meaning in Markov chains. Okay, so far so nice. I hope you like it too. However, with the theorem, I have already one problem. I don't know why there is this condition here with if there is an N0, blah, blah, blah. So if you know why, please tell me. So that's, there, are, there are holes in these things, right? And when you will look at these papers, at these original papers, that will also happen to you, right? You read these papers and there are always holes, so you don't understand everything, but at least maybe you get some of it and you get some fascination. Okay, now let's write the metropolis algorithm that we've seen before, but let's use now the notation of the diaconus here. First of all, we are only searching over a finite state space, yeah? And there is some probability distribution, so that was our stationary distribution, and it should be the stationary distribution of our Markov chain that we're about to define. And that is the P star that we were looking at, okay, before. Let's define um, now our, our proposal distribution. Our proposal distribution here now gets a new letter. It gets the letter J and it's also a transition matrix for some Markov chain, okay, on X. Basically it's saying I'm right now at Y and it tells me how to sample a new X. So basically the Y will, um, oh, do I do this the right way around? Oh no, it's the other way around. So given that I am at location X, I'm having the X row in J and these probabilities tell me how to sample the next state. And so that is basically the proposal distribution from the metropolis algorithm. And in this case, I'm having the metropolis without Hastings algorithm. So it has to be symmetric. Okay, so this now means for the matrix that it's a symmetric matrix. And of course, the J and the pi can be totally unrelated, right? Because the pi might be defined are normalized and I don't know much about it. And the J might be something, previously it was a Gaussian distribution. Here it could be a uniform distribution, for example, over all possibilities. It could be any distribution. Then the metropolis algorithm, these different steps that we defined, that now transforms this transition matrix into a new transition matrix K. Okay, where basically now this is a mathematical description of the metropolis algorithm. And you might remember that before I defined over here, whoa, where was it? I had this definition of the transition probabilities, right? Which looked a bit awkward and a bit strange. Where did I get it from? I got it from the MCMC paper of Diaconis. So that's a full description of this transition probability. So let's basically rewrite this same expression, but now let's do it with matrices. And also Diaconis does a slightly different case distinction. So I, in my opinion, simplified it a little bit for our purposes. So let's look at it at this transition. So there's still the case distinction between staying where we are and going to a new location. However, here's a case distinction between having the acceptance ratio larger than one and having the acceptance ratio less than one. The reason being that he's defining the acceptance ratio just as being the quotient and we defined it with the minimum of one and the quotient, okay? So if you get rid of the minimum, you need this additional case distinction over here because the A could be a number much larger than one. And so that's why he kind of splits the first case into two cases. Okay, so here's basically this minimum operation in, hidden in here in this case distinction. Good, and the rest stays the same. Just the integration is changed by the 
summation, a finite summation now over all that where the acceptance ratio was less than one, okay? And for those of the, all of those, I need to sum it up. Again, this condition, we didn't had it for the integration, yeah, because the A, if it's equal to, if it's greater or equal to one, we were taking the minimum with one. So in that case, then the alpha would be one and that would lead to one minus one, which is zeroing out the term at the end. However, since he can has arbitrarily large R's, A's, so he needs this additional condition in the summation down here. Okay, so this is now describing the transition probabilities. And the curious thing is here, so our starting point is some probability distribution from which we want to sample and a transition matrix could be anything, could be uniform distribution or whatever. And then there's this expression which looks a bit intimidating, but it's basically another description of the Metropolis algorithm yeah, by directly describing the transition um, probabilities. So what we have here is given a probability distribution and a transition matrix here, I have a recipe to define a new matrix. And for this matrix, one can show that it fulfills the detailed balance with my probability distribution pi, which is then basically a little lemma. Uh, it, this is a lemma and then it can be shown that then pi will be a stationary distribution of K. So starting with the J, this operation transforms the J into a new transition matrix such that its stationary distribution will be pi. Okay, so that's like a more abstract view on the Metropolis algorithm. Okay, and having this detailed balance, then we can have the same equations as before where we showed that the pi is now a stationary distribution of k and before we showed that the p star is a stationary distribution of our transition probabilities age. Great, so this is again another point of view. So the Metropolis algorithm transform a matrix J into another matrix k, yeah, such that it has a certain stationary distribution. And this can be viewed as an operator on Markov chains or an operator on matrices. And something interesting, which I haven't tried yet, so those are open questions, at least for me. So what happens if I would apply this operator onto the K itself again, and again, and again, and again? So I could do it several times, right? So I guess maybe one can show that the K doesn't change if I apply it twice. Why doesn't it change? Because, um, it is already, it has already the pi as a stationary distribution. So it would be fine if it stays the same. And in that case, it would be an idempotent operator, right? However, maybe you don't care. I just wanted to give you a more abstract view on the Metropolis algorithm. However, let's apply it now to our decryption example. And let's look at some code. So here's the MCMC demo. And um, so I'm, this is really based on um, the diagonals paper. And so let's run it. So I again base it on NumPy. So to keep it really simple, let's go through it. So this is the true text. In this case now, um, this is like a, a piece of Shakespeare. Okay, to be or not to be, that is the question and so on and so forth. So this is some English text um, that I can print here. And for speed, I um, select only a couple of them because otherwise the algorithm is a little bit too slow for my laptop. So let's just take the first 100 letters of this one. Maybe it's going up to here. I have no idea. And set some random seed. Okay, so there are already some random seeds which work very well on the MCMC method so that it works at the end. Of course, there's always a little bit of trying. Okay, so that is storing, just showing us the text. Let's implement the encryption here. So the encryption works like that. So we are given an alphabet, which are just the usual letters and the space. So there's no mistake. So there must be a space in here. So I have a couple of letters and now I can generate a code, a random code by just creating a random dictionary for scrambling my string. So how does it work? I um, take my alphabet A, which could be Z1 and I zip it together with the alphabet A, which has been randomly scrambled, okay? So this random punct sample A is basically permutating my string A, okay? And I zip them together, making like a list of pairs and then turning the list of pairs into a dictionary, okay? And then the result will be a dictionary where I can put in the letter E and I get the code for it, 
okay? Or I can put in the letter Z and I get a space for it if that's the code. Then there's a way to invert the code. So if I have a random code, I want to use it for encryption, but I also want to decode it. And for that, I just switch the roles of the values and the keys in my dictionary. So this is very nice Python code where you, you take the values of your dictionary and the keys of the dictionary, you swap places, you zip them together and you generate another dictionary from it. Okay, so that is like simple, nice code. So let's run it. Okay, now how can we use it for decryption, uh, for encryption? So let's generate a random code, okay, and have an, have an encoder, which is a C, and a decoder, which is a D. And then my encryption function takes a code, some text, and basically it iterates through all the letters of my text and has a lookup in my code, which is my dictionary, okay? And then all of them are again joined along the length of the text, and this will encrypt my text. And then I can print basically to check my implementation. I can print the true text. I can encrypt my true text and then I can encrypt my encrypted true text. But once I use the key for the encoding and once I use the key for the decoding, okay? And as you can see, I get something super scrambled in between and then something not so scrambled afterwards. Okay, so far so good. So that's part of the infrastructure. I think I run a bit over time, but um, it won't take too long. Okay, so that is now the scrambling. Now the next thing that I need to do is I need to define my pi or my p star. So what is the probability that I'm after? Okay, and I'm saying now I want to find, starting with a scrambled text like z1, I want to search the space of all of these dictionaries, of all of these encryptions, and I want to have at the end a text which looks like English text. And how do I define this likelihood for being English text? I define it by n grams of English text, where n grams basically mean a one gram are unigrams, just looking at the histogram of the different letters in the English language. But I can also look at bigrams. Then I always look at neighboring letters and I look after an E, what letters are most likely follow. I could also look at trigrams and foregrams and so on and so forth. Let's for simplicity first look at unigrams and I show you how they look like. So I have here some text. I think this is a translation of Dostoevsky's War and Peace. And I have another one from Tom Sawyer. So those are just long English texts. And I'm just running now a statistics going through the whole alphabet and finding out how many letters are in the uh, one piece, how many E's, how many A's, how many B's, and so on and so forth, and then getting a distribution. But there's also an implementation here for bigrams, trigrams, and also quadruple grams, okay? So if you want to try that later. So let's first run it for n equals one. So it looks like, okay, and then we get like the histogram of these letters, okay? So I have a visualization for n equals one and n equals two. So this is the histogram of English letters. So the, those are the number of E's, like the proportion of E's. Most of the letters are spaces, curiously. Okay, that's just how it is in, in Tom Sawyer. And this is a, characterizing basically the English language. However, it works better if we take bigrams. So let's take bigrams. And there's also code that is visualizing it now nicely. So let's look at it. And this tells us even more about the English language. So it tells us if the first letter here is an H, then the second letter is most likely an E, okay? Or if the first letter is a J, then the next letter will be a U, okay? So justify, so these kind of words. After a J, looks like there's a U following. This last column or the first row, the last row here is also telling us what are the most likely letters to start a sentence, okay? looks like a T, like in the, or a W, like in what, for questions and stuff, they are more likely than the other ones, okay? So this is like giving us a description of the English language, great. Now we use that one to define our unnormalized log probability. Okay, why log? Because we are multiplying here many numbers, so it's better to go into the logarithms. So what am I doing here? I'm iterating again over the whole text and picking n grams from it, 
So n being equal to two, it will take bigrams from my text and then look up in my statistics, which is basically this matrix, what's the probability of seeing this pair of letters and then taking logarithms and summing everything up. Okay, so this log probability function now is calculating me for a given text where the letters are most likely wrongly assigned, how likely this looks like English text. Okay, and now the next idea is to use MCMC to increase this likelihood, to get samples from the English distribution, from the English bigram distribution. So one thing is missing still, the, um, our um, proposal distribution. The proposal distribution does the following. It takes a dictionary and it swaps two places and spits out this new dictionary. So it's just taking the current dictionary, which is generating me some decrypted text with a certain English distribution. Yeah, and I take this dictionary and I swap two letters and I get a new solution, okay, which might be more likely or less likely. Okay, so let's evaluate that one too. So that is a random flip. And you see the random flip here has nothing to do with the distribution of my log plausibility, right? It has, it's completely orthogonal to that one. Okay, and then comes my MCMC implementation. So I'm starting, I'm initializing with a random code. I'm using it to encrypt my true text that I have. Oh, not the true text, so the text is the encrypted one and the true text variable contains the unencrypted one. So here I'm taking the encrypted text I decrypt it now with my random guess, calculate a log plausibility, and then I go on. So my proposal distribution is generating me a new code. Yeah, I generate a new text and evaluate its log plausibility. Now, if my new log plausibility is larger than my current one, I immediately accept it, okay? If not, I throw a coin with a certain probability where here, since those are log probabilities, I take the difference and then e to the difference, which is the same as taking the quotients of the probabilities, but it's numerically more stable here for us. And then possibly I accept it or I don't accept it. Okay, good. Then finally, I print out what I get. And so let's see whether it's working. So let's see what we get. So what do we see here? So this is the initial guess. So that was the initial guess. And then after a thousand iterations, it looks a little bit already better than English, at least like the word distribution already makes sense. So it looks like it found already the right key for the space, right? So it looks like the right key for the space was the L. Okay, so that was the letter that was used for the space in here. And the plausibility down here is also increasing. That is the one that we try to maximize here since we are sampling from it. And we go on and so forth. So here after 2000 iteration, we have already to B or not to B, but the B is a P still. That is the question whether it's a snowblower. So this is already getting quite close. And let's scroll down a bit. So here's the, uh, after 10,000 iteration, I think we really solved the problem, but here the Q wasn't found. So the Q was found earlier, but it was flipped back. And it looked like uh, we jumped down a little bit from 5,173 uh, to 5,172. Okay, so it got a little bit worse. But you know, this can happen in MCMC. Okay, and this at the end is the true text. Here again, you see the curve, how it's going, how it went up. Let's run it again. So we were quite lucky that it works. So actually, sometimes it doesn't work and it's just staying at something wrong. So here you see now after the first thousand iterations, it didn't got the space right yet. Okay, it's still wrong. Here it got the space right, but it still has the, instead of having a to be or not to be, there are a couple of letters which are very wrong still. And let's say at the end, we didn't reach a good result. So here we are at 4,945, okay, which is not up to the 5,170 over here, which is like the one for the true solution. Okay. So the application here is not really generating samples um, that, that we then later on use for integration or any of these things. It's just generating samples from a really difficult distribution, which is defined by the bigrams. Okay. And it's, uh, has a property that it doesn't get stuck in local optima. 
So even if it is already quite good at some things, there are some probabilities that it might find something else. Okay. Um, and now, of course, you could also try something. You could here take the n equals three and see whether it's it's better, right? If you take three grams, so the code should also run. So uh, let's see how fast it goes. Can it do it? But meanwhile, oh, okay, it's already done. Great. So the n grams for n equals three are generated. So let's update these functions here and let's run it again. And let's say only for 1000 points and let's say whether it's faster and getting faster to the solution. Okay, nice. So here already after a thousand iterations, it's kind of solved the problem almost. So we can try it again. Maybe we were lucky. So let's run it again. And this time we were not lucky. So this time we were stuck. Okay. Notice here that this number has changed. It was 5,100. Now we are using trigrams. Of course, now these numbers are very different. So, okay, it's not working so well yet. So it's a little bit fiddling around with the parameters. Okay, so that is the demo of um, Piazzi Diaconis, which is like yet another way what you can do with um, these kind of things. So here we are at the end of our sampling and the Markov chain Monte Carlo section. However, we are also at the end of the machine learning lecture I thank you a lot for your attention. It was a lot of fun also to see a couple of faces. And I think the interaction was very good. You pointed out a lot of errors in the mistakes, which I tried to improve. And um, I think the code programming, the code was very motivating that there are students who are really eager learning something and trying it and giving feedback to it. So that was very nice. Also for me, motivating to put more code online. And at the end, I think it helped all of us to better understand the material. So again, thank you for attending this lecture here and I hope to see you um, at some other point. At this, maybe at this point I stop the recording and I wish you a good day. Bye bye.